So I'm going to crack on right away and I'm going to be talking about a site that has become one of the, I believe, one of the most important sites ever discovered on the planet, certainly in the last few years. Um, it's a site I've been visiting since around 2014 with Andrew Collins and also more recently with JJ since 2018, before it was even excavated, which actually only started happening in 2019. Now this is the sister site to Gobekli Tepe. And I'm gonna do, I'm not gonna to repeat too much because we did talk about it a bit last year, but I'm gonna give you some updates. I've got some new scans of the site and a bit of footage uh, that you might be interested in. And also you can join us obviously in Gobekli Tepe and Karahan Tepe and numerous tours that we do in this area. This area being the Fertile Crescent or what some archeologists call the uh, Golden Triangle area of um, ancient Southeast Turkey or Anatolia. But if we zoom in to this area here, this is what has become known, uh, what the archeologists call the Tas Tepela region, which means the Stone Hills. And there's numerous sites here of interest. All the ones on here are either been excavated or in the process of ex excavation or going to be excavated as part of this grand project but Karahan Tepe and Gobekli Tepe are the key sites, the ones really properly only open to the public. But there are a few others I want to mention today because of their importance in the bigger picture of what is going on down there. Now the thing is, these are so ancient compared to places like Stonehenge or even the pyramids and things like this. It's almost twice as old as some of these sites. And so when Stonehenge was being built, this had been covered up for five to six, even 7,000 years possibly. And, and being, you know, it was an ancient site when Stonehenge was being built. This is our first visit. We actually, uh, we took Graham Hancock there on his first visit back in 2013. as part of a tour myself and Andrew were organizing. And now they have a roof built over it, of course. This is a close up of some of the, um, a more close up of some of the key areas of, um, of Tas Tepela region. This is a quick overhead look at the main enclosures in the southeast corner of Gobekli Tepe that have been excavated. But the problem we have with all these sites is that most of them were buried. And so this is, this is where it gets really, really interesting because this is all they've really excavated. They've excavated a few little areas on top of this. But if you look at the scan they done of the whole site, you'll see what we're dealing with here. And that's just one site. This is one site out of a possible 12, which we believe there's up to 20, maybe even 30, that still kind of eventually be discovered. There's an artist reconstruction of some of the enclosures at Gobekli Tepe. And this just gives you a sense of scale of one of the enclosures with JJ uh, inside a reconstruction of enclosure D, which is in uh, the Chandelurfe Museum, the local town to the area. So these are not small sites, these are massive sites, and they go back nearly 12,000 years. Now there's a lot of research we've been doing for the book. Um, we've also uh, been working with Andrew Collins, and this is some of his research is to do with the astronomy, specifically the Milky Way and Cygnus, which is the image on the left here. And there's also other researchers who've been looking at the alignments from Gobekli Tepe, claim that Sirius, which would just be occurring above the horizon around this time. And also Orion, Taurus, and the Pleiades, uh, which people like Robert Schock and other researchers suggest may have been in the southern skies from this area. But more likely, we have the northern sky with the Milky Way, the Dark Rift, and Deneb in Cygnus, which a lot of research has been done by Andrew looking at this. And even this plaque, which um, was found at Gobekli Tepe, which we actually first noticed on a tour we did in 2015, appears to depict pillars with the stars of Cygnus in the sky behind it, looking through a central stone here, which is also at the site. Now, that's just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to that. Andrew's the expert on that, and you can you know, get his books, watch his videos about this. But one of the things I've been doing, which is kind of a fun aspect of uh, my research, is going to these sites and scanning some of the artifacts. And we get some quite fun things. This is the stone totem pole, um, which was discovered in one of the later layers at Gobekli Tepe. And you can try and work out what's on it yourself. You've got like serpents, you've got like a baby being born almost. 
you've got like what looks like potentially a leopard's head which has been broken on top with ears and numerous other features which people haven't been able to work out exactly what it is. This is the famous kind of goddess statue, one of the only depictions of females at the Beckley Tepe. And it was like a chunk of rock, again found in one of the later layers at the site. And she appears to be giving birth or doing something else, perhaps. And this is another very interesting artifact. Uh, I'm just kind of showing off these scans because often you only, you only get photos and you can't really see everything on them. And we find these scans, you actually discover things, you notice things that you may have haven't noticed before. And look at the quality of this stonework for 11,600 years ago. It's really quite something. We also have other porthole stones like this one. This is almost like a life buoy, like a ring, a stone ring, which uh, was found also at Gebekli Tepe. And there are numerous disciplines you can look at to try and understand these sites. One of these is what Giles was brilliantly talking about, and that's acoustics. Because again, Andrew has been looking at the acoustics of the site and numerous other researchers have as well. This is a, uh, the artwork by Dan Lish for our forthcoming book. And Andrew and Rodney Hale noticed that many of the sites are elliptical, including Karahan Tepe to some degree as well. And this creates acoustic kind of properties uh, linked with the human voice. And you can see the two from Gebekli Tepe at the top there and Karahan Tepe and a later an enclosure at Gebekli Tepe on the bottom. Numerous experiments have taken place there. So following on from what Giles has said, this is really happening nearly 12,000 years ago. These sites were designed with acoustics in mind. And also when they were doing research there, there's uh, various people from the University of Trieste, uh, Pablo uh, de Batolis and others, Linda Enix and others, they found that it resonates um, 68 to 69 hertz with harmonics of 91 to 138 hertz, which is the basic musical fifth. But when they were there, they also found a spiraling magnetic field in the center of enclosure D at Gebekli Tepe, which would affect consciousness, but it also can enhance seeds and grains, which is an area of research that I've been looking at. And this could have been part of the more religious aspects of the site. This is another piece of artwork by Dan Lish for the book, um, looking at some of the more, uh, what we believe was Neolithic religion at the site. But also with the recent major earthquake that took place there, there's been big question marks as to why Gebekli Tepe and the other sites were buried. And there's a good chance that earthquakes may have been happening because the, even near Channel Earth and near Gebekli Tepe, they felt tremors of the earthquake just recently when it happened uh, a few months ago. So were they, I mean, this photo on the left is a photo JJ took from our hotel, um, on the top, that is, and on the bottom, a similar photo from just after when the earthquake happened at a place called Gaziantep. And it is near an earthquake zone, very close to it, Gebekli Tepe and the other sites are. One of the other sites that we've got some interesting scans from, which are some of the artifacts, is Navali Churi, which has been written about extensively uh, over the years. It was one of the first places excavated. But one of the most interesting things here is this structure. It was like a, almost like a home, a building. And underneath it, it had these sort of channels cut out where water from the local stream, cold water would flow through it and cool down the property. So this is actually the first ever air conditioning and this goes back to 8300 BC at least so we've got elements of very sophisticated very unique clever technologies that these people were working with and we even have uh, this particularly strange stone head was found in the niche in the main temple there and you can see the face is missing but on the back of it we have this remarkable almost Vedic ponytail which is very similar to what Vedic priests wear We'll come on to a bit more about that shortly. This is another scan um, of one of the artifacts. This is it's thought, some people suggest this could be some kind of watcher or angelic figure. And this is one of the totem poles that was found at Navali Churi as well, which has been reconstructed. So there's many, many different beautiful pieces that are being found in this area from a much earlier date than anything else really. Uh, till five or six thousand years later. Yeah, so these just absolutely blow my mind. Um, 
But there are other aspects to these sites, as well as these beautiful scans, obviously. And uh, so we have these um, geometries as well, which we've now found at the site. These are all based upon Alexander Tom's research. And you can actually see some of these uh, at some of the enclosures that we've been looking at. Now these absolutely fascinate me, uh, the fact that we're finding these kind of things here. Because we find them in other areas as well. We're now finding them at Karahan Tepe, and we'll have a look at a couple of those. Um, but as I said, Karahan Tepe is it's about 23 miles southeast of um, uh, Gebekli Tepe. And here's just, this is a fascinating view of it because we've got, a friend of ours got some drone footage and it gives you a sense of what's been uncovered so far. I think that's like absolutely stunning just to get a sense of all the different aspects of what is going on there. And these, these are the two very interesting enclosures. You've got uh, the Pillar Shrine, you've got the main enclosure, you've got the unfinished pit there as well. And you've got half of this huge stone circle is pretty much carved from solid bedrock, which is one of the unique features of this particular site. We have very strange stone heads have been discovered, uh, which don't make any sense. This one's extremely elongated or perhaps wearing a hood of some sort. We have canid figures or foxes or, or panth uh, different types of cats, kind of almost mountain humans as though some kind of shamanic element going on here. This is a close up of what the head looks like, what the human figure on the bottom there looks like. We also have these beautiful stone plates, which are like polished and have kind of cut marks within the center of them, which could, according to Andrew, and, and we've been discussing this, could have acoustic properties and may have been tapped during ceremonies at the site. We also have this very strange figure. Now, we, this has been classed as being a two-headed figure, which has kind of braids in the hair. But we, when we did the scan, we realized, if you look from above, which you can see on the next, next scan, it's actually two kind of paws of animals holding the heads. Now, officially, they haven't, the archaeologists haven't even noticed that, but we noticed that when we did this scan. We found this quite remarkable. And this is some new artifacts that have only just been discovered. And these are reported on by uh, Neshmi Corral, the main archaeologist there. Now, what these are has raised many questions. There's like some strange kind of shaped beads. There's this little thing as well. It's only like 10 centimeters wide. And it's got these chevrons all around the top. No one is sure that's carved out of solid limestone. We've got this thing here. This symbol as well has been found at Kortik Tepe, which is further towards the Tigris, Tigris River. And you've got this beautiful little stone frog as well, as well, which has also been recently discovered. And this is the geometry we actually find at the site here. It's very, very interesting. It's an egg-shaped circle with semi-elliptical end type, type three, according to Alexander Tom. And this is very close to this. It's not exactly this, because it also very, works very well as an ellipse, which is the research that Andrew's been doing. But it was here that we found some very interesting alignments, which we'll come on to shortly. And it's just another view, uh, which gives you a good sense of the condition it's in now. It was clearly kind of, it was clearly kind of damaged or decommissioned before it was closed down. Although the pillar shrine, or structure AB, appears to have been preserved and stones placed in it, kind of covered up and protected when it was closed down, whereas the main enclosure looks like it had been damaged. This is the pillar shrine itself, and I've actually got it on my t-shirt as well. And uh, this is a scan I did very cheekily while I was there. And this gives you a sense of what is going on here. I mean, really, it's really difficult to ascertain what these people were thinking, but this is the giant head this size protruding from a wall with serpent scales on the neck and with these 11 standing pillars 10 of them carved out of solid bedrock about four and a half to five feet tall with a final one which you can see here on the left in the main picture almost looks like a kind of rising serpent which is placed in this very small pit and balanced there and this was all filled in and everything was placed and covered over completely at the end of its use only uncovered in 2019, 2020. But this is the view that me and JJ witnessed when we went there 
on the winter solstice morning in 2021. And this really got us because as we were there, we discovered this through this porthole stone, light was hitting the stone face and moving around it. This is another view of it hitting the face there. And here's just another, I'll give you another scan of the site before we get into the alignment. But this just gives you a good sense. It's almost like you can be inside it. They don't let you inside it now, but you can certainly get close to it and get these scans. So this is kind of what it's like. And you can see the porthole stone there, the head there that gets illuminated. And you can see these are very strangely shaped and cut. But this is pretty much the angle where the, how the sun comes through, the sunlight comes through. And you can see how tall the enclosure is around it. Comes through at this angle, goes through the hole and illuminates the stone hand. Only works on the winter solstice morning. And it still works today, although in ancient times it would have been a, almost a degree, maybe just less than a degree difference. And there's the head through the stone itself. And this is what it would have looked like. This is what it looked like to us in the modern era. Whereas in ancient times, it would have been slightly different, a slightly better illumination of the head. So we visited there again in 2022 with Andrew, JJ, and some friends that we have out in Turkey, some of the people that Andrew met. And we, went, we spent three mornings there recording the winter solstice sunrise just to check if it worked. We got full readings. We, got, uh, we analyzed it using Stellarium and found that, uh, along with Rodney, Hale and Andrew, and we found that it was a slight, you know, it was obviously gonna be like, there was a slightly different place it would emerge the sun on the winter solstice morning. And these, this is the slight difference that we got, where it would be slightly to the right of where it is now, and at a very slightly different angle. So it would, in fact, illuminate the head better than it does now, proving that this was a genuine alignment. This is actually a time lapse. You can actually see, this is all speeded up. This is the way the sun moves today across the head. So this is speeded up somewhat, but you can get a sense of it. And so we would, you know, and look at the shape of it. This is something that JJ spotted, and also Graham Hancock spotted when we sent him it. It looks like a human fetus as well which is a very unusual thing. Me and JJ have an article we're gonna be publishing about this. And then it kind of finishes on the serpent scales that are kind of going down the chin there as well. Very unusual. This is an, uh, some, a graphic that Andrew put together showing the, the where, how, how, how the sun moves. And it would kind of go between the two main, it would go between the two main T pillars in, at the center of the site, like you get a Gebekli Tepe you've got here. And go right through them perfectly, go through the whole stone and illuminate the head. It doesn't work at any other time of year, it's just the winter solstice morning this would work on. And so there are many other sites around the world. You can actually see a full article that we did on Graham Hancock's website looking specifically to the winter solstice and what it's all about, how it compares to other sites with the full analysis. And part two, which is gonna be coming out in June, we look more into the different fertility aspects of this because they're very phallic, these pillars that we find inside. And they look very much like the Cappadocia um, fairy chimneys as well, which is kind of strange. There's also lots of symbolism there as well, which is something that JJ specializes in. And we're finding lots of these statues with strange symbols like V-necks, uh, even the V, there's almost like a V on the head inside the Karahan Tepe enclosure here. You've got Vs here, this is the Urfa Man or Baliklagul statue, which is found at a site inside Channel Urfa. This is Saybirch, a newly excavated site, which has actually been known about for 100 years by the family. We got to know the family. And this is remarkable, again with V-necks, they're all holding their phallus. We've got, and this, in, the, in this itself, we have phalluses next to the head. So there's all this kind of strange symbolism, which we, we've been trying to decode, which we'll be publishing about soon. But also it's very similar, this is something my friend Charles Costa, something JJ commented on is that it's very similar in style to a Shiva Lingam that we find in ancient Vedic Indian tradition. Um, these are like, and usually the Shiva Lingam is in a kind of pool of water where water can drain in and out, and it can here, you go through there. There's also a channel here that it can go in and out. And also we have the Navali Churi stone head, which is very much like a, a Shika or a Vedic 
priest's ponytail. So what is going on here? How, you know, is there a connection with ancient Vedic culture? In some, in some authors, um, there's various people, suggest that it actually influenced Vedic culture. This is where it may have even come from originally, with all the astronomy that was being recorded at the site. Because we know now they were recording the winter solstice. We know now they were working, recording Cygnus, Andrew's research, there's other ideas that they're recording other things, perhaps even procession as well. And so there's lots of different things to consider when we're looking at these sites. There's lots of, uh, there's lots of other strange symbolism we find at the site. We find cut marks all over the site, which this is something that JJ's been looking at. These are like, according to Maria Gimbutas, these are like receptacles of the goddess where moisture and water would collect and be used in rituals. We have uh, kind of feminine kind of carvings in some of the bedrock and other parts of the site. We have other cut marks. I mean, these cut marks are everywhere. I mean, these are the first real cut marks ever discovered at an ancient megalithic site, long before the ones in Britain, for sure. We have serpent channels cut all over the place into the rock and more cut marks just above the main enclosures at Karahan Tepe. But we have other, other strange things happening here. We have um, lots of kind of almost very skinny type statues or ribs showing, showing like emaciation, as though there's some kind of starving going on or there's some kind of, you know, poverty or there's not enough food and things like this. These are all from Karahan Tepe, these ones. These ones are from Gebekli Tepe. We have a similar thing, some of the most famous ones here, including this critter crawling down one of the statues. So there's lots of symbolism which we're going to be decoding, putting in the wooden book, but also in a book and articles that JJ and I are working on. This just shows you some artwork, again, that Dan Lish has been doing. This just shows you the night sky, something that Andrew discovered after we found the winter solstice alignment. Andrew looked, was looking towards the south in the sky and he found this remarkable thing where Scorpius would rise and also, or it would be in the sky, I'm not sure if it rose or set, and the Milky Way would be kind of vertical across the horizon, sorry, horizontal across the horizon. And then later on the sun would rise and we'd have this whole situation where the head would get illuminated. Again, this is more artwork by um, Dan Lish. And then after this, all sorts of things would be going on, we believe, during the day, all these celebrations, different things. This just shows you, a, a, you know, an idea of how it would have looked. With the, this is just a, a work in progress, this piece of art. We're going to be expanding this uh, with the stone benches, some of these statues placed where they were found, some of the stone plates, they were found on the benches as well. Um, but it proves that even in ancient times, they were working, very ancient times, they were working with the night sky and also the sunrises and sunsets. Because also there's a summer solstice sunset alignment as well that Andrew noted linked with the unfinished pit. So there's quite a lot going on here. Even in Jericho, they found a summer solstice um, alignment which is uh, someone that Andrew and I have been chatting with, Ram Bakai, who's an archaeologist from uh, Tel Aviv University. I had a chance to actually visit here recently uh, and actually got my hand down this top of this Jericho Tower because they were, they were on strike because there had been a terrorist attack two days before, which I didn't know about. Um, so I just turned up there uh, unknowing and the archaeologists let me in. I persuaded them and I had the whole place to myself. So I had a very interesting time there. Um, it was completely safe, of course, and quite wonderful. And there's some reconstruction to Karahan Tepe. This is one done by an unknown artist, um, but we have other ones. This is a, a recent reconstruction, um, kind of looking roughly north of what the site would look like with all the enclosures that are starting to be uncovered. So this is only really what's been excavated. They think only 1% of the site has been excavated. There's a lot more to come. And there's just stones lying around like this, just tea pillars. Where this one's interesting, she's got like a kind of creature there and a serpent going along, kind of going up the actual um, tea pillar itself. This has also been noted, this was actually first noted by Bartin Selick, one of the early archaeologists. Um, and there's lots, these are very strange carvings that have been found on top of the main hill, which have yet to be decoded. So if anyone fancies decoding this, um, let us know how you get on. 
We don't know if it's a counting system, it's some kind of moon calendar or something else. But there's uh, still a lot of research needs to be done to try and understand these sites. This is the site of Say Birch. This is a very interesting uh, panel that was discovered. Andrew and I and JJ, we visited this. Um, and this just, no one really knows what's going on. There's different ideas of what this could mean, which we're gonna be writing about. But it just shows you that stuff is still being discovered. It's, this was literally a house was built over the top of this. And they kept it secret for almost 100 years. <laughs> and we've got to know the family now. But there's other strange carvings, like the one on the left there. And you can see there's even like a, a big hole in the center of this, what would be an enclosure. You've got cut marks there, right above it. You've also got indentations going around the top of the bench, which suggest T-pillars were placed in them as well. And this is, uh, just shows you the strange carving here, which is almost got like a serpent's kind of head or a mushroom shape with all these indentations. One of the T-pillars that me and JJ, when we went there, we noticed this is how we found the site because they don't give you the, they don't let, really let you go in there, but this has actually got carvings on it, which you can just, you just about make out hands and everything else. Another site of interest is a Yan La Hoyak as well, which is very, very interesting. We actually, JJ and I actually discovered a broken T-pillar just lying around at the site. Uh, and we think, and Andrew agrees with us, that this is going to be big news soon when they start excavating this. We're, we're, make, we're planning to go back there because we've found a few things there which we can't really talk about yet. Uh, but we got to know the local kind of uh, village kind of officer and he kind of showed us some artifacts that they'd found. We've got exclusive photos of those. But this could be bigger than Gebekli Tepe. And this is the T-pillar uh, that we found just lying around. Hasn't been reported, hasn't been mentioned by archaeologists anywhere. So I'm gonna just summarize a couple of things here and then we're gonna move into JJ's thing, but I wanted to give you a quick update of what's going on down in this region. I mean, I've been looking along with people like Howard Crowhurst who came up with this, looking at the geodetic links between the sites. We're gonna go into more detail in the book. Howard's found connections with Baalbek here. We're gonna find, when we found, like we put this all together, this is all gonna be in the wooden book and we've found ley lines, we've found, great triangles linking these sites up all across the landscape and even across the world in some cases where we found connections in measurements and metrology with places like uh, the Coracancha in Peru, Easter Island where you get very similar type carvings. But we found very strange things that, especially Gebekli Tepe seems to be the one that connects up with sites, not just across the country, but all across the world. And it just gets stranger and stranger um, the more you look into this. And you can just see some of the strange connections, which I'm teasing you with because I'm not going to talk about it now. Um, so, yeah, so I wanted just to give you a quick outline there. So I hope you appreciate that, uh, that we, you, there is serious archaeology going on. They're going to be excavating all this year, all next year, possibly for the next 10 years. And it's only just begun. So if you are thinking of going to anywhere like this, we do recommend you check out Southeast Turkey over the next few years because this is where it's happening. It's like when they were first discovered the pyramids in the jungles of Mexico or the polygonal walls in Peru in antiquarian times. This is now happening in Southeast Turkey. And these sites are much older than anything else and much more sophisticated in many ways. And you can see that the influences with the geometry, the metrology, even the astronomy may go back to this very early epoch. So thank you for listening. And of course, you can join us there uh, September and May when we take trips out there. And uh, we hope to see you out there or very soon. So thanks very much for listening. <laughs> <laughs>